it's a story. I mean, um, a mother uh, brought you to Verkhoven. I mean, I've never been there. <laughs> mother brought me um, to Verkhoven. Have you been there? Never. <laughs> um, well, and then, I mean, it is traumatic, but it's also a great family history. I mean, there's so much to dig in. I feel, I mean... I feel like I've had several different lives. You know, my father was a Baptist minister, and he, my, my mother was a Shanghai socialite. She was, she was jailed at one point because my, she left her husband, this playboy, and she fell in love with my father, and, and the, the husband had her arrested. Uh, yeah, and then she, he left to go to MIT. This, he had a scholarship, and she came two years later thinking she's going to marry now without divorce of the other guy, marry this engineer and instead finds out that my father has decided to become a poor minister. So talk about, a, you know, a, a change. And then, of course, she has to face the death of her husband. The, and, the death of my brother, brother and my father, six months apart of brain tumors, which I think would make any, anybody wonder about the coincidence yeah. of that. Is it purely bad luck, or is it a kind of bad luck that you should find the reason for, which is exactly what my mother did. And, you know, the answer to bad luck is to move to Verkoven. <laughs> and she probably felt guilty somehow. She felt, you know, I, I think a, a, a parent especially would feel that they hadn't done enough. You know, there's always one more thing you could have done. And my mother, she, if she could have turned the clocks back and time backwards, she, she would have done that. She did everything, uh, much to my annoyance, because I was ready to give up. I was 15, and I was already cynical. And I just wanted it to be over. I knew when they were in a coma, they were not coming back. And I had been this, this very good girl, went to church every day and didn't do anything. Playing, piano. Playing the piano, studying hard, and everything went bad, and I decided I'm going to be someone different. And so I went wild when I came to Europe. I, I was still not wild when, when I was in the Netherlands, but I came, became wild later. I heard you were arrested. I was, yes. In, in I was arrested huh? in Switzerland. Um, my boyfriend, the very first boyfriend, uh, Franz Adams Josef Grunauer. I heard he lived in Amsterdam, actually. Oh. He came to live in Amsterdam. Is if he you're, here? <laughs> if you're here, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to sl slander you. I'm, I'm sure you're a really wonderful guy today. You're probably a wonderful businessman or, you know, doing good for the world. Um, but back then, he, <laughs> he had, um, you know, he didn't have a job. He, uh, so, and he had friends who were drug dealers. Mm, that sounds terrible, but basically they sold hashish and, you know, I mean, it's legal now, isn't it, here? Um, it's he sold nuts. hashish and my mother hired a private detective who's also the mayor of the town because it's a very <laughs> small town. And, um, and she, he, they compiled this evidence, not just on my boyfriend and these drug dealers, but on me. And so I was arrested. I didn't have to stay in jail. I had to promise I would obey my mother. I, you know, I would n never smoke or drink or do any of those things. And, you know, I was just like, yeah, you know, I, I promise. And Good so, girl. Yeah, well, I left. I left my criminal record behind and started college in the States. Good. And I met this guy here on a Ooh. blind date, my husband, who we met Boy, over 44 years ago. Yeah, 44 years ago. That's yeah. probably longer than most of the people in this room. And <laughs> I'm, I bet. Talking about the book um, and a little bit about the research you did, because I think you really did well. Um, Thank you. That means a lot because you are a, a sinologist, an expert in all of this in culture. So, well, nothing, thank you. Uh, no <laughs> expert on the Qing dynasty because you know China. It's a lot of history. It's in a China lot of history. history. <laughs> when every every time I go to China, I tell I'm a historian, and my topic is China. They say like, "Wow, Chinese history. That's even difficult for us. You know, it's five thousand years." But I think you did very well, and I loved the part, of course, on you know the clothes all the rituals in the courtesan house, because yeah. 
I had never read about this uh, so extensively, and I think you did a lot of research. You How know, did there, you do that? There's surprisingly a, a, a number of books on courtesan culture, and also during the turn of the century when it flourished, and particular to Shanghai. Uh, the courtesan culture is different, for example, in Guangdong, in mm -hmm. Canton. Um, and, and so there, there were three academics uh, that I was able to talk to, three scholars. Uh, each one had written one of the books, and they didn't always agree with one another on uh, interpretation of data. The strange thing was, you know, there, were, there was a lot about how the houses were run, uh, you know, where the girls came from a little disagreement on whether they were literate, how many of them were literate, what percentage. Yeah, um, they could recite poems right, and, and yeah. sing. And, right, yeah. whether they could sing. And, uh, you know, I, I was able to look at those facts and also, you know, at the Qing Dynasty, what was going on there. Everybody has their viewpoint there as well and the ports of all the different players. So I had to choose one and tell it through the viewpoint of a particular person. And that way, you know, you, you take an interpretation. Um, what the academics could not find was anything about the tricks of the trade, so to speak. You know, the secret trade, the trade secrets, well, they remain trade secrets. And they were important because some of these women were reputed to have made their um, mark on, in history because of their sexual techniques. We just don't know what they were. We also know that wives uh, paid courtesans to show them what had taken their husbands away from their beds. Uh, so we know that was important. And so I had to, I did some research there, but I had to improvise as well. You read a famous book, I, I heard. Yes, I read um, The, plum, the um, plum and the Golden Vase, which is a very, very famous novel, very literary novel, but a lot of it was expurgated. All the good parts, all the literary parts, I'm sorry, were expurgated and all the nasty parts were left in, and so it became known as a pornographic novel. Um, and then there were versions, many versions of the uh, you know, sort of soft porn and hard porn. And the complete translation is, it makes it one of the most literary novels by Anonymous and also one of the most pornographic ones, same time. Yeah, I think it's banned in China, huh? Yes, which means it's widely read. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, Well, it's a, maybe a very um, um, cliche question, but it's something that made me, um, well, some way I wanted to ask you. What are your sources of inspiration? I mean, I think it's, it's family, of course, but I think you're much, um, you're very creative and you're very humorous and you, you look at the world in a very open way. So I'm just look, wonder what makes you write? You know, I, I as, always go through my mind, what is this notion we have about creativity? And you were saying that you saw this video, um, a TED talk that I gave on creativity. Uh, and I started preparing for that, not knowing at all what I would say. Um, how can you describe that? How do you go in somebody's brain and pull out exactly what's happening with the synapses and, and then interacting with the physical world that creates what somebody terms creative? And um, I looked at the possibility that it might be something innate that you're born with, that your brain is configured in a certain way to love words and to manipulate things and see things in a certain way that leads to greater imagination. But what does greater imagination mean? Does it mean outside of reality? So it, again, it comes up with these questions. I think what makes me um, what gives me inspiration is simply these questions um, that I have to ask and seeing them reflected in everyday life all the time. If you ask a question like, what is love or what is forgiveness, you're gonna see examples of it all the next week constantly. Different examples of fake love, true love, you know, um, lost love, whatever. If you pick a focus, you'll see it. That's, 
that is the beauty of, of a focus, and all this becomes a filter that comes to you. It seems like coincidence. Um, I also think that the older I get, the more experiences I've had, and that I realize that imagination and inspiration comes from many more associations that happen spontaneously, and they jump into the same territory. So we often keep this part of how we think here and this part here, and then suddenly they just merge automatically without effort. And I believe that that um, process, or I wouldn't call it a process, it's just, it's like, breathing or digesting or something. It just occurs. Um, and, and then this inspiration is really pulling things out of these filters that I have accumulated, which includes uh, things about my personal past, certainly, a lot about that, as well as my family's past. And, and the questions, you know, I mean, this photo I thought I was done with family secrets, and then I see the photo, you know, and, and now I, I've heard another secret, you know, about my mother, and I'm thinking, oh, oh. yeah, no, the, the, I you mean, can they share never they, already? They, they never stop. <laughs> they never stop. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, that's good and that's, that's bad, but it causes me to re examine over and over yeah. again my life, which is good. It's good. I, I don't like that kind of stability of thought. Uh, I, well, it struck me when you said that your sister said that imagination, her imagination got rusted somehow. Huh? Oh, she said that, but she is so imaginative. <laughs> uh, she can get herself out of and into any situation she wants. You know, we have different forms of creativity, and it's not just painting or, or writing or, you know, sculpting. Cooking. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean cooking. She's an amazing cook. But she can also find a way to, to solve a problem. And one of the things she said when she and her husband went to the United States, he had been a surgeon. And of course, he wasn't qualified to be a surgeon once he was in Wisconsin. And so he worked as a, sh a cook in a restaurant. And one day, she, or no, he was a surgical assistant. And it felt really, it was really demeaning to go from surgeon to handing the knives, you know, and just doing this. And one day my sister said to him, time to change the little knife to a big knife. <laughs> and then they opened up a restaurant. <laughs> She's funny. She's hilarious. We, she comes and stays with us. We fly her out and she stays with us for 10 days and, and cooks. And, uh, you know, if I, if I were mercenary, I'd just bring her in every few months and write down everything she says. <laughs> and do you communicate in English with each other? Uh, mostly in Chinese, half in Chinese, half in English. When we're in China, definitely in Chinese. She does speak uh, English, um, but she's much more comfortable in Chinese. And because most of our conversation is about food, uh, whether or not you're fat or thin, um, whether that looks good, or a lot of family gossip. We can do that in Chinese. Good. So, yeah, family gossip is always better in Chinese. So they have this one, they ha it comes with gestures that really are painful. Like one of them is, I don't know if you've ever encountered this, I'm not going to do it the way that it actually happens to me. Mm -mm. It's punching the person in the arm saying, now do you believe me? Yeah. yeah. Now do you believe me? It's like, ow, yes, I do. <laughs> they do that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they're telling and they're you something. They're always also very direct. I mean, yeah. asking you, like telling you, like how, how, how uh, tired you are. Yeah, looking, yeah. Oh, you look oh, much you. older <laughs> than you did, you know, <laughs> last month, or you've gotten so yeah. fat. Or the thin one is you should eat more. You look sick. So do you go often to China to see them? You know, I used to go at least once a year. Um, to my friends who go every month, that is not very often. So it's a matter of perspective how often once a year is. And sometimes twice a year. But I, I haven't been back in a year and a half, closing on two years because I've done so much traveling. Yeah. You're in a book and tour. Book tour yeah. And uh, you just want to be home. You're not going to add on any more trips. 
So after this tour, you will write again. I think I will busy. write, yes. Um, what are you going to, what is your next book? I'm going to write a nonfiction book, and I already started it. I couldn't really write um, the novel. I've learned that it's very bad to write a novel when you're in the midst of telling people during an interview what your latest book is about. Um, so I decided that, um, actually, I didn't decide this. My editor uh, decided, um, when he asked me what this book was about, when I was about to begin, I, I hated that question because what you do is you say, well, it's about three women who go on this journey and they find, you know, and it's so flattened out as this narrative. It's none of the things that I've told you up here of what I think about that goes into the book. And I decided to write him a note, and it was called About the About, which is about me, the writer. It was about 4,000 words, and uh, it just was... No. Uh, it was. It just went on. It just spilled out of me, and I gave it to him, and he said he wanted to publish it. And, and I said, "This is so private. You don't get to publish this. You know, I'm just telling you who I am as a writer." So he says, "Okay, okay, we, we won't do that." And then throughout the writing of the book, we were emailing one another, um, and we ended up with. Oh, it's probably like 2,000 emails now. It was 1,500 emails, and they weren't all they weren't all um, informative. They were all things like yes, meet at you know, 15 Ludlow or something. Um, but a lot of them did have to do with writing. Some of it very particular to the book, The Valley of Amazement, and some of it just about how I see uh, many topics like death. Um, I think about death every day. And it is not with a sense of fear. I'm not looking and saying, oh my God, uh, I'm going to die. What am I going to do? But it's the nature of life and death and um, uh, love and, and all of that mixed together. I think people look at, at death in a, in a fitting into a certain parameter as opposed to going into these other extensions of, of who we are and... Um, how we become all the way up into death, because death is, is really almost like a guiding point subconsciously that many of us have, whether we die at a time that we think we're going to die or die accidentally. Actually, you know, a lot of people, my editor does not like to talk about death. He's very, you know, very nervous about elevators and things. And, and I said, you know, a lot of people are afraid, and I don't know why people daily don't go running out of buildings screaming, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, you know, because it's inevitable. Um, is it something that is a theme for you for a long time, like this death? Well, a lot of death has happened in our family, and so it's caused me to think about it and, um, you know, the nature of it. And also, because I had a father who was a minister, there was always an afterlife. But the afterlife depend, depended on certain conditions, um, namely in his religion, baptism. And uh, so, you know, I had to think again, what it, do we mean by afterlife? Is there an afterlife? Is there consciousness? What is um, all this, what does this matter according to what we do today? Those, those kinds of questions, uh, you know, But the usual questions. I don't think you believe in faith. I mean, I think you... You have still the feeling that you can change things. You can and fate or faith? Fate. Oh, no, f fate. Yeah. Fate. Yeah. yeah, fate. It's not the, and it's destiny or something. Yeah. Like well, I have a different notion of, of fate, and I think that people think of fate in the old way, meaning you have no control over that, that fate uh, is something static, and you just have to get carried along with it like a flood. But I think of fate as also the place you find yourself, that somehow there you never expected to be there, and it, it is unexpected, you're there, and then you can move from there. You don't have to go down the river, you can, um, you can go a different way. And so I, I think fate can be changed, because it is your fate. Exactly. You already showed us a picture of uh, the band, the uh. rock band. Yes, uh -huh. that I shameful saw, part yeah. of my... Um, 
The Rock Bottom Remainders was created when, uh, over 20 years ago. Um, back in, at a time when it was shameful, it would have been shameful for me to wear that costume. And I was close to 40 and it was like, Phew. you know, it was, it was good. <laughs> kind of funny back then. And then over the years it became kind of um, ludicrous. Now it's pathetic. Um, <laughs> You know, you see older women, they're wearing mini skirts and heavy makeup and all of this, and it's, um, I, you know, go for it. <laughs> but on me, it looks a little pathetic. So I, but we do this for fun and because we need to, you know, we can't take ourselves seriously. Um, our excuse is we're raising money for charity, for First Amendment rights, but it really is because we love playing together. The members of the band include Stephen King, Dave Barry, Mitch Album. Um, these are people you may not recognize if you don't live in the United States, so they're very big uh, writer, authors in terms of uh, their um, uh, people who are known. Uh, Matt Graney, I saw somebody ask me to sign a Simpsons. Something, a Simpson. I was on The Simpsons, um, and I was yelling at Lisa um, in a book fair, telling her she like, oh, Mrs. Chan, I love the mother-daughter thing. And I said, that's not what my books are about. Sit down, I'm ashamed for the both of us. Um, <laughs> but, so Matt Groening is a friend, you know, that's how he got me on The Simpsons, which to young people, that's the greatest thing I've ever done. Um, he's in the band. Um, Roger McGuinn of the Birds, he's a real rock and p roll person. Uh, Roger McGuinn, um, uh, Ro um, Warren Zevon, uh, he was with our band till he died. Um, Judy Collins has sung with us. Um, um, the boss, what's his name? Bruce, Bruce Springsteen, Springsteen. Wow. excuse me. That's jet lag. Bruce Springsteen has played with us. So can we've had ask, a lot of real you come, people. You should, yeah. Al Cooper. You should come over to Amsterdam. I'm sure that we can find a good venue. Yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, the joke only goes so far. I think it's not international. Oh, you know, you really I have know. to know, you know, Dave Barry, oh wow. I don't think Dave Barry crosses the Atlantic, you know. Um, oh, you do, you do. So, yeah, you know, but we have a great time. We, we retired tw uh, two years ago, but we're still, now we have like the the uh, Rolling Stones, we have the, what's it called, the reunion tour or something like that? Yeah, now we have the reunion tour. We'll be playing next in Tucson. Oh, Arizona. Yeah. yeah. And it's old rock and roll. It's things you would recognize because if you didn't, we tried to, you know, you would think, what's that song, you know? But it's so familiar um, because we're not, not a great band. We're not a really bad band, um, and and be, when you're not a really great band, you have to show that you don't take yourself seriously, mm -hmm. you because if you attitude. do, then yeah. people think you're really a lousy band. But it's all but, an appearance and attitude. But you must have good texts then. Good what? Texts. I mean, oh, you mean texting back and forth? No, I mean, because you are such a good writer, so you have good lyrics. Text. Oh, good <laughs> lyrics. No, um, I've been singing the same song for the last 20-something years. <laughs> These boots are made for walking. I oh, hated yeah. that song, but it's because of being the dominatrix I have to sing the song, because at the end of it, um, I say, are you ready, boots? And then I say, bend over boys, and all the boys in the band, I'm the only girl now, all the boys in the band bend over and I whip them. <laughs> I have a whip, and then people think I'm really great. So that's, that's my role in the band. I have never, I, I would say almost never, maybe one time I remembered the lyrics. Almost every time I'd sing this for over 20 years, I always flub the lyrics. I can't remember them, but it's part of the act. I, I can't remember them. I come in and I think, what's the next line? And then I look at Dave Barry and he is laughing hysterically and he shouts them out to me. And that's all part of it. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's not, you know, it's wonderful not to take yourself too seriously. And I learned through that experience a very wonderful lesson 
Um, and that is about the audience. I used to find it so awful to give speeches. I would, thought I was saying the same thing over and over again. But no, it's different every time because the audience is different. And what the audience gives to you is reflection of what you also, it's an interactive thing. You give to the audience, they give back to you. And, uh, and you're figuring that during every performance. At the end of every gig, as we call it, we are in the back and the first thing we talk about is, hey, how about that audience? Um, so we talk about different qualities of the audience. 